Hello, and welcome to the first part of another episode of Tales from the Penny Bloods. This one entitled The One Handed Lady, based on a short story that Calder Campbell published in the Keepsake magazine in 1843. It features one of the first werewolves in British literature, but it also has other supernatural surprises as well. Summer comes late to the stately hilltop home nestled in the rural countryside of the English Midlands. The picturesque landscape extends in every direction. Here and there, a few sheep and cows standing at ease in the gentle sun. This is the home of Henry Tambor, who happily shares it with his sister Cecilia, her husband Charles, and their little boy William. Behind the large stone house lies a beautiful garden, where Henry and Charles construct a trellis for the climbing roses that rise high among the constellation of flowers. Nearby, Cecilia putters in the kitchen garden devoted to vegetables and herbs. Charles and Cecilia smile as they watch their son run past in play, then share a more serious look as they address Henry. A beautiful day, Henry, is it not? Summer is finally here, and all nature rejoices. Nature may rejoice, but for me, there can only be sorrow. Oh, come now, Henry. It has been almost two years. I buried my joy on that fearful mountain, Charles. Where Lillian has gone, I hope soon to follow. Soon? Perish the thought, brother. You're a young man with your whole life ahead of you. She's right. It's true, sorrow has hit you hard, but death comes to us all. Until it does, we must live and at least try to enjoy the time that we have. If only that were possible. My poor Lillian. Henry thinks back to his honeymoon, days which began so happily, so full of promise, until... Are you warm enough, my dear? Yes, of course. When my friends stuffed their trousseau with fancy dresses, I filled mine with outdoor clothes for hiking in the Swiss Alps. It's always been my dream to honeymoon up here. It is beautiful, and I must confess, I love the way the mountain air and exercise color your cheeks far more than the stuffy atmosphere of London ballrooms. Though I do miss the music sometimes. We shall hear plenty of music when we reach Vienna. Have no care about that. I know, and I'm in no hurry. Our time in Switzerland has been magical. I love being so close to the glaciers. It makes me feel so free. I simply want to run off and touch them. I know what you mean, but you mustn't. It's dangerous this time of year. Oh, don't be silly, Henry. I only want to feel the icy cold on my fingers. Lillian, Lillian, what are you doing? Don't leave me. I'll never leave you, Henry. You know that. Come back, I tell you, come back. Not until I feel the glacier. But we're in avalanche country, don't you remember? I'm almost there. It seems so mystical, the way it gets colder as I approach the enormous wall of ice. Stop. You mustn't. Not so close. I'm almost there. Lillian, look out. Oh, Henry! Lillian, Lillian. Lillian, where are you? A tortured expression comes over Henry's face as he relives these tragic memories. She is gone. They never found her body. Not even a grave where I can mourn. Oh, Henry, you mustn't torment yourself. You must let her go. Just like nature blooms after the darkness of winter, you yourself must go on. She is never absent from my thoughts. It is in vain that I strive to forget her. Not forget her, no, never. 
but... Now I can only think of her as she perished. Surely, brother. Frozen beneath that fatal snow. Oh, Henry, I loved your bride as though she were my own sister, and I miss her smile every day. But you couldn't save her. I could have died trying. Then you'd be gone as well. Oh, so much the better. How can you say that? Oh, leave me alone with my heartache. As Henry walks off, Cecilia tries to grab hold of his arm, but her husband shakes his head no. Let him go, my dear. If only he would listen. This melancholy is destroying his health. If he's not careful, he'll follow his young bride into the grave. I think that's what he wants. But we must give him something to live for, a, a future to hope for. Uncle! Uncle! Play with me! Play with me! Oh, William, my dear boy. Perhaps our son has the answer. He's the only one who can make Henry smile. Yes, I think he holds the key to his uncle's heart. And who knows, perhaps someday Henry will have a boy of his own to love and care for. With the coming of autumn, business concerns force Henry to part from the idyllic solace of his family's estate and travel to London. Must you leave us, Henry? Your health is only recently returning. Yes, playing with William always makes me feel better. But I cannot put off leaving any longer. I must go immediately. I know you have responsibilities, but I wish you wouldn't go. Just now. Why not? What's wrong? It's silly, I know. It's only that I have this feeling of foreboding. Cecilia, you're, you're white as a ghost. It's nothing, probably. I've been having this dream. Come, come, my dear. You mustn't worry Henry with your dreams, just as he's going away. But it's not just any dream. It's the same dream, over and over. I think it means you're in danger. Danger? Bah! It's a dark forest. You're there, and William too. And something else. Something hunting you. Hunting me? What is it? I can't clearly make it out. But it's some kind of animal. Something large and ferocious. Like a wolf. A wolf? Well, I know the wilds of London will be different than my simple life here in the country, but surely it won't be as dangerous as all that. No doubt I'm being silly. Still, you will be careful, won't you? Of course. And no matter what, remember you must come back to us soon. I'll return as quickly as I can. But that is not to be. Autumn turns to winter as Henry meets with solicitors and accountants, untangling his family's business affairs. Still, Henry does not devote all his time in London to business. Once reacquainted with the social scene, he seeks out old friends and makes new acquaintances. Soon, he is quite the man about town, enjoying himself for the first time in years. It is at one of the season's dazzling balls that he meets her. Why, well, here's a sight for sore eyes. Delighted to see you back in London again. Hello, Richard. Henry, old man, good to see you. And you too, George. I hope you'll stay with us a while. It could be. You know lawyers. My affairs seem bound to keep me here until spring. Topping, my boy. It'll be like old times again. But what's this? Who is she? Who indeed? It can only be Francesca, Marchesa di Polioni, dressed in a fashionable, if exotic, gown. Attired in the finest fabrics, adorned with jewels, she wears her long, dark hair pulled back to reveal the pale profile of a beautiful face. Though her clothes stand out amid the splendor of those gathered, her hands attract the most attention. 
Every eye in the ballroom focuses on her single gloved hand. The long slender fingers of her bare right hand and the silk glove of her left both sway gently at her sides as she glides into the ballroom. Everyone present studies her with fascination, the men with admiration, the women with awe at her seeming power. That's the Italian Marchesa. People call her the one-handed lady. How strange, but how beautiful. Yes, beautiful and fantastically wealthy, but also distant and aloof. Every man in the room desires her, and she rebuffs them all. But come, Henry. We must get you some refreshments. Yes, of course. Oh, but she is very lovely. We hope you have enjoyed part one of The One-Handed Lady. Stay tuned for part two, in which you'll hear the mysterious stranger say, A lady! Ha! This is no lady. If you only knew what she's done. Listen to this and other episodes of Tales from the Penny Bloods on Apple Music, YouTube, and Spotify. And follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Mastodon, Pinterest, TikTok, and X. If you like our show, please subscribe at our website, TalesFromThePennyBloods.org. 